So I would posit to your listeners that is it really about keeping your money or giving money, or is it really about you getting comfortable with the idea that government can be a solution if we put the right people, you know, in power, and if we put people in power who are problem solvers, right? Who are not in it for themselves. The end goal is to put the people in power who can effectuate these solutions, right? So that we don't have to do that on our spare time. Welcome to the Vietnamese. I'm your host, Kenneth Nguyen. Being part of a culture of nearly 100 million Vietnamese people in the world today comes with a lot of pain, proud history, and privilege. Join me as I highlight and explore the Vietnamese experience from all over the world. Hey, Katie, how are you? I'm well, how are you? I'm well as well. I start every episode with uh, what does it mean to be Vietnamese to you today? Well, when I think about being Vietnamese, I, of course, think about my family and my heritage, right? And, um, you know, I think about all the things that I grew up sort of learning about and loving about who I am. Um, but it's been a journey and it's a journey about at first sort of this identity that's innate in you and how you look and your name and all that stuff. But then later on, I think be, being Vietnamese means um, sort of a call to duty, right? A call to action that you remember where you come from and you remember your community in everything you do. So that's kind of where I am in my life right now is thinking about how I can um, you know, contribute and give back to my community uh, specifically the Vietnamese diaspora. Interesting. Where where do you think that call of duty uh, comes from? Man, I tell you, like as a Vietnamese daughter, I think you're born with it. <laughs> it's like a guilty complex, right? Like you're you are expected to be a dutiful child, you know, take care of your parents, uh, listen to them, um, make sure that you don't. Um, uh, bring shame to the family. <laughs> um, but, you know, outside of that, um, the sense of duty, meaning that you're part of this bigger community. You know, when I first came to the U.S. with my family, we settled in New Orleans, Louisiana. So there wasn't a lot of us. And our little small community was really tight knit and we stuck together. And so I think being a part of a very strong family that was rooted in our heritage and then being a part of this like a resettlement, you know, program with a larger community where we didn't look like anybody mm -hmm. in our community really gave me that sense of, you know, like I'm part of something bigger than myself. And this call to duty is really about um, sort of expanding the opportunity set for our people and um, being able to, to uh, define what community should be like, uh, is like, and what it could be. What was it like growing in Louisiana and how old were you when you got there? I was just a toddler. I mean, I, you know, we uh, fled Vietnam just like every other family um, uh, after the fall of Saigon, of course. Um, we made our way to the U.S. Uh, around 1979. And um, by way of Malaysia, we, we were in the refugee camps in Palau. And... Um, we had one distant cousin <laughs> that sponsored us and he actually lived in uh, New Orleans, Louisiana. We didn't even know where that was, you know, like you yeah. may have heard of LA or New York and like, where is this town, New Orleans, Louisiana? So we ended up arriving there. Um, and at the time when we were um, resettled in New Orleans, we were, re we were resettled in a, a housing project in uh, wow. Eastern New Orleans, yeah. And it was primarily a, a black community. Um, and again, as I mentioned, there was only a few of us. And so our first impression of Louisiana um, was sort of this very strange culture. Um, and, you know, there's, <laughs> if you know anything about New Orleans, you know that they have their own language, their own yeah. way of doing things, their own food. So um, looking back, I'm thinking to myself, I never really understood what Americana is because I grew up in a very European Creole right. definition of the South until I came to California was when I realized that, you know, there was just so much more to it than what I grew up knowing. You know, um, I, I know your background, uh, your I've read it that your family came from, you know, uh, a better position than, you know, how you arrived did, do you think that they understood what 
the housing projects were when they arrived? Do you think, or do you think that they thought that this was the United States? All of it was, do you think they yeah. were, were they, did they have a, an understanding of like, oh, this is where we're placed right now, but you know, we can move out of it or would in their mind was like, this is the reality of the United States. You know, my dad um, had resettled twice, right? After Dien Bien Phu in the North in 1954, his family relocated from the North to the South, lost everything, came to the South, met my mother, um, built a new life. And then of course we fled Vietnam. So he always said to me, um, I lost my country twice, mm. right? And so when he came to the US, he knew that it was starting over. So he had sort of that, that experience mm. before and he, he was sure that he wasn't going to be able to rely on, you know, you know, he used to tell me a story about how like in Vietnam, he was a, a businessman. So a lot of people bought things on credit. You know, he was the kind of guy that was like, if you needed uh, a Jeep for your farm, or if you needed a pot or you know pan or whatever, he was the dealer. He would go to town and he would go and grab those items and sell it to you like at a, at a profit, right? And so he was the wheeler and dealer. And a lot of people bought on credit because, you know, right. I mean, it would be harvest time and then they would pay up and settle debts. And he used to say to me, you know, all these people that you see here owe us money <laughs> um, in some form or fashion. But when you come and arrive uh, in the U.S. in that moment, you realize that everyone is starting at zero, you mm -hmm. know? And he knew sort of innately that we would have to start back at zero and rebuild sort of the life that we wanted for ourselves and for our family. So, but, you know, kudos to him and everyone else who had the tenacity and the, you know, the work ethic and everything to make uh, life better for us. How, how old were you when you all moved out of the, um, the housing projects? You know what's so funny is I didn't even know I lived in a housing project until um, actually I we want to say like a month ago, uh, and the reason the reason I I even knew that it was a housing project was because I was watching this documentary about the first ever Vietnamese American congressman. He was he's a Republican uh, from Louisiana, from Richard New Orleans, Cal, in my Cal. district. Yeah, uh, um, what is his first name? But I know it's Cal. It's the last Thun. Uh, something like, something like oh, yeah. that. Yeah, it might be. Um, but it was, you know, he was representing Versailles, which is the, the district that I grew up in. So I'm watching this uh, documentary about him, about his rise to power and how he had to kind of broker yeah. the Vietnamese community and the African American community, right? And then they were talking about how he like represented this, the second district or whatever. It was like a housing project. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, <laughs> that's where I grew up, you know? So in your mind, just goes to show you, in your mind, you can have a perfectly well-balanced childhood and not even know that you have gone without, right? That you have lived in something less than, and that's a credit and testimony to my parents, right? For making us Huge. feel like we were never second class and that we had everything we needed in order to succeed in life. That's huge, yeah, that's huge. It's working from a, a major advantage. Um, to have mom and dad understand that uh, from from an early from an mm -hmm. early time, but you know when I go back now, it's like uh, the community is in dire straits. You know we have uh, a lot of potholes, a lot of uh, sanitary issues, sanitation issues. I mean, you know during Katrina, they wanted to dump all of the debris um, from the entire city uh, right next to our our town, our village. And, um, you know, the, the Vietnamese people rose up and protested. And then that was the only reason why they didn't do that. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, it became sort of like, if you can imagine a housing project, a dumping ground for mm. Katrina debris, right? So, so um, I, every time I go back to visit and I, I take my kids back now and I show them sort of, you know, the very humble beginnings of life here in America mm. and what a privilege it is for us to be able to have this opportunity that we have, right? The irony of having a an area called Versailles. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I know. It's a village of the East, but then we called it uh, Versailles. And um, a couple of years ago, we actually went, we, I took my family to Versailles. <laughs> and it wasn't lost on me that it was like, okay, this is interesting. A juxtaposition. 
definitely. It's almost like uh, yeah. our, our Vietnamese community almost. But um, so <laughs> you get true. To high, true, true. You get to high school and college, and what do you decide? What like where where's the direction where you're headed? Well, it was always imparted on me um, by my parents to, um, you know, to seek as much education as possible, right? Like my parents, my dad, especially, he was like um, very soft on us girls. You know, I grow up, grew up in a very big family. I have 12 siblings. <clears throat> so I'm number 10 out of 13 kids. And um, my dad always said to us girls, go, you know, get, go to your, go do your studies, you know, focus on uh, you know, um, getting your education. And then my brothers were always like forced to work. <laughs> they would go and do odds and end jobs, you know, on the weekends. And, but then with, with that, they, they got a lot more independence than us girls, you know, they would get a car when they were of age. We didn't get a car because mm -hmm. my dad didn't want us going anywhere. Um, so it was very patriarchal in that sense, very traditional uh, in terms of family values. Um, so I went to school and one day and growing up in the deep South, you know, you get a sense of like being held back, you know, like you, you're like, God, there's gotta be more to life than what I see in front of me. I mean, granted, it's a very exciting city to grow up in, you know, New Orleans, there's a lot of things going on, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, I could be in Kansas or Iowa, right? But there's a lot of things going on in New Orleans. But I also felt like, I'm like, there is this bigger world out there sort of waiting for me. And then one day I was reading the news um, as like a, a freshman in high school. And I was reading the news and I was thinking, oh my God, there's this guy who went to class completely naked. And I'm like, what school is that? You know? And he made the news because he was like, yeah. So then I found out that it's UC Berkeley. I'm like, let's go check out that school. That, that school looks insane. like fun. That is an insane <laughs> story. You know, a lot of people were like, oh, I like that football team. And, you know, I'll go there for that. Or I like the science experiments that they were not a naked guy running, <laughs> streaking. Well, you feel a sense of oppression a little bit growing up Catholic, growing up in a very <clears throat> patriarchal family. <clears throat> and then you grow up in the deep South. And so I just wanted to go. I wanted to go to the most liberating place that I could possibly and go. And, and that was Berkeley. And, and I had no desire whatsoever to go to Harvard or Yale because I thought, oh my gosh, from one op oppressed state to another oppressed state. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where I went. I went to Berkeley, loved it there, huge campus. I'd never been anywhere you know, like that. And it was the first time I ever took like an Asian American studies course. First time I met a gay person first time i met so many asian americans that you know you know was outside of my you know friend group so it was it was a totally new world to me um i did everything from rushing you know in a sorority to um being a resident assistant uh one one semester or one year and then um you know, I just tried everything. And it was like the world was my oyster. I just finally sort of like, you know, absorbed everything that I could possibly absorb. So as you're transforming into this new person, um, <laughs> West Coast, Berkeley, open, a little bit more open-minded, becoming more progressive, what, what kind of interactions are you having with your parents um, and your family back in the Deep South? Yeah, I mean, we would talk um, and they would say, you know, do you have enough to eat? <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, are you studying hard and that kind of thing? It was always very um, superficial, you know, very like just check in. Um, but I wasn't really telling them about the transformation that was happening inside me, you know, or like the things that I uh, was experiencing. And I think that was part of, that's part of the college experience, isn't it? Like yeah. <clears throat> being able to find yourself, find your voice, things that, and try new things. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think they were shocked when they came to visit, you know, how much I have grown as a person, right? Um, because you have to, when you mm -hmm. leave home and you go and you go to college and you're on your own, you're making your own money. And, and I had to work um, uh, to, for spending money. So, you know, I, I grew up really, really fast, but it was also a sense of growing up in a little bit of uh, feeling like I was deprived 
you know, of, right. of things and opportunities that I felt like I wanted, I was in a hurry. I was in a hurry to get done. I was in a hurry to go make money, you know, to sort of start my life. Like, I don't know what I was wanting to do, but I just wanted to do it, like to just begin. And originally I thought that I was going to be a lawyer um, and then, you know, graduate in three years from, from Berkeley and then go to law school. And, and I did the first part, I graduated in three years. And then um, I decided to take an internship um, at a financial company. And then I just stayed. And my trajectory was, you know, um, very fast, very quick. Uh, I did very, very well in the business world. I took my LSAT, but I never went, I never applied for law school. I just stuck with business and I, yeah. I just got, a, I just had a knack for it. Now you're on the younger end of 12 kids right so there has mm -hmm. to be these older people that are not as progressive they're stayed in the south and they have a probably a very different viewpoint because of their age right um does that come up in those years or subsequently in those you know five years after you graduate you know your, your viewpoint's changing and then you're leaving behind family traditions and not traditions but more like their perspective you're leaving that and you're moving on, were those things that you had to deal with or is everybody in your family very progressive? Oh gosh, no. Um, I mean, we're Catholic, yeah. <laughs> patriarchal family. I have a nun in my family. My uh, sister is a nun. I almost had a priest in my family. My older brother went to the seminary, uh, almost became a priest. Um, so no, I mean, I would say that I, I come from a pretty conservative family, um, but I don't think that I, uh, had voiced. I, I don't think I found my voice within my family um, until much later, you know, and, um, you know, fast forward to today, for example, you know, I have lots of nieces and nephews that follow me on social media, and they're getting a taste of it so that they're not getting from home. And so I'm sure there's some clashes in that generation, but now I'm free, you know, now I'm a grown up. <laughs> so yeah, I, I don't necessarily have to deal with that. I ask you this because Obviously, it's very linked to the work that you do. It's linked to the work that I do. It's linked to sort of the transition in our generational, our cultural sort of transition or transformation. Um, and there's the polarization that that's taking place. Um, you know, whether it's the computer algorithms or truth that people see and the difference that in the truth that people see, the facts that people see. Um, you know, how is that being sort of handled in your family today, you know, with all the, the older, you know, these, there's 10 people that are above you in rank, and are they seeing the world very differently from, from the way you're seeing things? And how do you mitigate that when you all get together? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, um, I have a very good relationship with all my siblings. And, um, you know, when you have 12 siblings, that's a feat, you know, I call myself right. kind of like a diplomat just mm -hmm. for, for that, <laughs> for that success. Um, but, you know, what I tend to do is I, I have a very, um, I have a very understanding, open mind, uh, you know, uh, to them, uh, the way they think about sort of the way the economy should work, for example, you know, they forget sometimes their life experience and how we started in the world. Right. And then a lot of times I will say, well, if that program didn't exist mm. for us, can you imagine where we would be today, but not for the compassion and the generosity of the United States and all these various different programs that made our lives you know, possible and set our kids up for success. Right. So it's more of a conversation about empathy and um, remembering where we started uh, from. Right. But also there's this, um, there are certain conversations that we have around, um, I wanna say quote unquote family values um, that to me uh, uh, is evolving. And so I just kind of try to meet them where they are and talk a little bit about it in personalized terms, you know? Because yeah. if you are friends with somebody, like if you are good friends with your neighbor and they may have very, very opposite viewpoints from you, but if you guys are friends, there's not that animosity when you talk and share your experiences, right? And talk about your viewpoints. And it's the same way that I see within our family is there's a, there's a deep love 
yeah. right between us. So there's never this very contentious conversation about um, different viewpoints. It always it always comes from a, a place of trying to understand the other person, and trying to meet sort of somewhere in the middle. I I hate to trivialize politics, but okay, this is the way I kind of see things, right? It's very basic. There's, let's just say there's two sides and it's basically saying, and I, I talk about this quite often. It's like, the debate is, I want to keep mm. money. The debate is you want to spend my money on, <laughs> right? It's yeah. This is what we're talking about. There's, you want to keep your money and I want to spend the money that we all have to put in the pot, right? That's mm -hmm. what we're talking about here all the time. There's got to be a way, and I think growing up, you and I, we probably experienced politics in the way that these two sides probably sat and said, okay, let's discuss this. Let's <clears throat> figure this out. Let's figure out yeah. a way. You want that. Yeah. I want this. Let's try to figure this out. And both sides have their logic. But today we're dealing with something different, right? A little different. There's all mm -hmm. kinds of like things that are like planted in there. But if we are like family, then we can talk and we can have these discussions. We can be warm about, okay, look, you want to keep that money. I want to spend it. We can have this back and forth, mm. but that's not, is that what's happening? No, I, I, I would say it's, it's not that conversation at all. So I would posit to you this. Um, it's not that you want to keep your money. I want to spend the money. It's that who can spend the money better, right? Correct. So we're all, paying taxes into this kitty, right, that the government controls, right? And uh, on one side of the equation, people think that government isn't really good at, you know, solving societal problems, that they waste a lot of money, that inherently people who work in government are not very competent. So they distrust the, the idea that government can solve the problems. Right. And on the other side, People are like, no, government should do it because everything else is so fragmented, right? And I would offer um, this perspective. If we were to give, to tax no one, right? Who would we rely on to take care of infrastructure? Who would we rely on to take care of uh, issues in between states, right? Or in between different households of different um, social status, right? There is an there is always an element of government, you know. Uh, there's a reason that government exists, right. but ultimately, it's that last ten percent, you know. It's whether or not I tax you for that ten percent, or you keep that ten percent so that you can do your own philanthropy, that you think you can do a better job than government can, right? And I would say this: <clears throat> in all the nonprofit work that I have been involved in. Uh, I have never seen a more fragmented industry than nonprofits because what happens is you have different players, you have the donors, right, who come in and they've achieved a lot of success and they, in a way, think that it sort of validates their knowledge and mm. their know-how and so they think they can solve the problem better than someone who's maybe had that lived experience, have worked with this uh, clientele or in this mission work for a long time. And there's that push and pull. And right. it becomes very fragmented because there are then pet projects. Then there's, you know, uh, this the nonprofit, you know, community, for example, they have to literally beg for dollars every year, right? To survive, right. to sustain themselves. So it's this power struggle that exists in the nonprofit community. It can never take the place of government. It can never be that centralized uh, force where it can solve problems on a massive scale. So I would posit to your listeners that, is it really about keeping your money or giving money? Or is it really about you getting comfortable with the idea that government can be a solution? If we um, put the right people you know, in power, and if we put people in power who um, are problem solvers, right? Who are not in it for themselves, who are not egotistical narcissists. <laughs> yeah. And that's hard to find because, you yeah. know, naturally, you know, you don't get paid a lot to be a, a, a politician. So you have to get something out of it. So it attracts, you know, a lot of narcissists. But, um, but that's, that's, that's the end goal. The end goal is to put the people in power who can effectuate these solutions, right? 
so that we don't have to do that on our spare time. It's very hard to do. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to do it, you know, in scale. So you're going along making all this money in your early years, (laughs) right? You're going and you're just trudging along, making the money. Why? Why jump into the fight? What, 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 what inspired you to kind of hop in and go for the struggle? So it's a tough world. Oh yeah. It's a tough world. There's lots of, you know, bad people in this space, you know, I mean, there's bad people in business, right? They cheat you out of money as soon as, you know, you make the the dollar. That makes sense (laughs) though. Right. Because you're really struggling for, you know, there's a tangible, you know, asset that you're fighting for, but this, philanthropic or political work it's it's more vision you know it's intangible you can't really you know what makes somebody jump in the fight and 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 go for your ideals yeah you know i was i was not you know i was not part of that world for a long time i i focused on my business i focused on um you know there's lots of challenges i you know spent most of my career in the investment management space and that's a white dominated male industry right and so even the things that I was doing, even the challenges that I was overcoming was already in some ways, you know, groundbreaking, right? Even though nobody knew about it, you know, it was just sort of like a, a private win. Um, but everything that I was doing in that space, every time that I would have a platform to speak about, you know, uh, any topic, it was somebody that they hadn't seen before. My face was not a common face, you know, in the industry. Um, so I took with me this, um, I bear sort of this responsibility, right, of continuing that work. And at the time, I wasn't advocating for like world peace. I was just basically showing leadership in a different industry that hadn't seen somebody like me, you know? And so in that way, I felt like, okay, so I've worked so hard to get to this place, right? And I've gotten all this credibility for doing my professional work. Do I then just kind of sail into the sunset? Yeah. Or do I use this platform or use this opportunity um, to do something positive, you know, for the community? And so, of course, I, I, I chose the latter. And I really didn't. It wasn't really a, um, a choice. You know, it was sort of like uh, something inherent in me told me that uh, it was my duty. You know, going back to kind of like how you we were raised, right? It was like to, to, much, uh, to people who where much is given much is expected right in return and so I felt very blessed in life to uh, be able to achieve the things that I've been able to achieve and I felt it was you know sort of inherent uh, in me and in my um, the way my the way I'm made up uh, to give back and so I, I really felt like I had no choice but but the way to do it was 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 my, of my own making right like how do you yeah. channel the intention of what you have, right? The purpose that you find yourself trying to fulfill in a positive way, in a constructive way, right? Yeah. You can be a disruptor, but you don't want to uh, set back the community, right? right? You, can, you can innovate and bring new ideas, but at the same time, you have to be cognizant of the struggle that existed before you arrived. Right. You have to pay homage to that, right? Because yeah. you're, I'm blessed because somebody somewhere did the hard work that granted me the platform, you know, to achieve what I could achieve. I need to honor that. And I need to build sort of that next rung in that ladder, right, for the next generation. When you say that there's a few things that you had accomplished that you broke ground um, in your investment uh, career, what can you talk about that? Yeah, I was very young when I first started my company, I was 27. And um, a couple of years after I started my company, I started to uh, make a name for myself in the investment management world. And I was asked to be a speaker about, you know, this very um, topic about non-performing loans. I mean, you know, who cares about that, right? But during the crash, uh, you know, during the crash of 2008, remember when Lehman Brothers kind of yeah. fell apart? Um, it was a time where we felt that sort of the, the world order, at least for Wall Street, was coming like coming apart at the at the uh, at the threads, and so the idea that I would be positioned uh, to make sense of the market, right? Being able to 
uh, be successful in these trades um, was really um, was really something that somebody of my age and somebody who looked like me uh, wasn't necessarily kind of like the, the 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 usual suspect. So I was asked to come and speak at the Milk and Global Conference uh, in two thousand and seven. So two years after I started my company, and it was something that I was quite nervous about because the Milk and Global Conference um, is sort of like the Davos of the West, right? right? So all of those policymakers and politicians and smart people would go to Davos, Switzerland. And then Mike Milken had something very similar in Beverly Hills. And so when I was asked to speak there, I knew that there would be all these well-known economists, Pulitzer Prize winning everything, <laughs> wow. Nobel Prize winning everything in the audience. And I was asked to speak on this very like uh, sophisticated topic, right? So in that sense, at you know, at my age, and somebody that looked like me, yeah, you know, that was very groundbreaking. And that was like a year or two before the collapse of non-performing loans, right? I mean, yeah. So I was early. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I was early. I was seeing the cracks in the market. You know, obviously with the real estate market at the time, and we were starting to. <clears throat> bring together a portfolio of these non-performing loans, but we were so early that we were able to kind of have our pick. They used to be able to give you a tranche, give you a portfolio, and you used to be able to pick the ones that mm -hmm. you wanted right out of the tranche. And then later on, when all hell broke loose and the collapse of the market, they would just say, no, you got to take the whole tranche because we got to get this off our books. So then we'd have to buy big tranches of non-performing loan portfolios. Well, um, but yeah. Wow. And what at this speech, what was basically your premise of what, what were you trying to do the message that you were trying to deliver to this audience? Well, I was basically saying why I was doing what I was doing and why I saw the cracks that I saw in the marketplace. Right. Because as you said, it was pretty early. So I yeah. was um, almost like, you know, predicting a crash before it happened. So it was very um, bold, <laughs> you know, to, to say the least. And um and then, you know, just being able to say that I was taking these bets, right? And placing these bets active in the market was just, was just something Very new early, as yeah. well. Yeah. A year and yeah. a half out, it sounds like, right? Or a year yeah. out? I mean, on Wall Street, they, they probably thought the same time I did. So, um, you know, a lot of people felt it later, you know, on Main Street, they felt it later. But a lot of people were, you know, were seeing the same things, the signs that I was seeing. And... If you don't mind me asking further about it, like you see it, you see the trends. What is the your action with your company? What do you do next? Because you saw that. Yeah. So what we knew what was happening was that these banks were buying these very inflated assets, right? And they were loaning um, money to these uh, inflated assets. And so we knew that there would be some kind of reconciliation, right? Some recalibration at some point. And so if you establish an early entry with these banks and say, hey, you know, I see that you're having some trouble with some of your, uh, you know, loans on your, on your books, you know, maybe we can talk about uh, us taking on that loan so that you don't have to um, uh, get that loss, you know, you don't have to absorb that right, loss. Right. And so in the early days, the banks were very accommodative because they didn't want to be embarrassed, you know, they didn't want to like be caught off guard and then all of a sudden have these bad loans on their balance sheet. So, you know, they would work with us and then we would, like I said, cherry pick the ones that we thought, right. you know what, there's something here, right? They have a substantial tenant or they had something going for them. Um, and then, so we, we just bet on the long term that we could ride this out, right? So we picked like the best assets. And so what would happen was, is that um, when the market fell apart, we were holding these loans um, and to some extent we knew that they were already non-performing so they right. were already uh, at risk um, so we went in and talked to the the various you know debt holders and worked it out this is what they call it a workout so we worked out the terms we adjusted it and so we were able to um, you know um, ride out the, the 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 fallout and then we were in a position of strength because before the market collapsed, you were able to get credit. You were able to you do all the things that you were able to do. 
as soon as you know the market collapsed, right. the credit market froze, yeah. Yeah. and so everybody was in a sticky situation at that point. Um, but we had been performing loans, we had good assets, we had tenants who were happy and performing. So we, you know, we were set up for success and, and a place of strength so that we could go in and then buy other distressed assets. And then what you do at that time is you, you know, you work through it, you try to figure out different strategies to keep everybody, um, uh, you know, in their loans. And um, I mean, it's, it's a complicated process which I'm not doing it justice right now, but <laughs> no, I, I, I think you're doing it a lot of justice. I, okay. I, I'm, I'm again, I'm a layman and, and I understand it clearly. So you're doing a great job explaining it. Okay. Um, and I, you know, you, you've made a very complex uh, subject, very simple for me to understand. So, I mm -hmm. that. so you go on this career tra trajectory and at some point you're like, okay, um, I want to get into the political side of, of, of the philanthropic work, do you open or Google or do you, have, do you have a mentor that appears magically? Like, how do you transition from one thing over to the next? Yeah, I mean, I wasn't, it wasn't like it was cold, a cold entry, right, into mm -hmm. politics. It's sort of like I was in business and then all of a sudden I went into politics because uh, with business, there's always some element of politics, you know. In fact, I remember when I was um, at that same conference a couple of years later, I was invited to this meeting with uh, Al Gore and he had started a, a company called um, uh, Generation Investment Management. And I was in a room with like 10 people and some of Redstone was there, of Viacom and other people were there, like really big bigs, you know, in, in LA. And so sitting here right across from Al Gore and Mind you, I, I wasn't a fan of Al Gore. I, I you know, don't really know that much about him, but I always felt that he was pretty, like, I don't know, pretty um, non-personable, you know, like kind of stale, you know, right. and didn't have a lot of personality. And I didn't really understand why he was sort of the chosen one in the party, you know, the one that would be the, the standard bearer. Anyway, so I'm sitting across from him uh, in this conference room and I mesmerized, you know, he had these like bright blue eyes. He was talking as if he was talking just directly to me. And I found myself really drawn into what he was saying, you know, and, and I thought, gosh, you know, this is, this is his magic. This is what didn't convey on the TV. But when you're in the room with these politicians, they have that je ne sais quoi, right? right they have right. that something. Yeah. So, um, so then I, you know, I, I continue to have dialogue with, him and his team and then um, met other people in the process and sort of just got warmed up to the idea uh fast forward to um Wait, can i stop you another what, oh what yeah did you, what did you have to say to al gore he just roll up to him and say hey uh, i got these climate ideas i mean what what was the topic no actually you know he came to the conference and he unveiled his um movie before it became a movie the inconvenient truth so he gave us a preview of his movie and uh his company um generation investment management was making investments based on an esg like an impact investing um platform right before it became sort of a big thing a common right. thing and so um you know we just talked shop we just talked investments we talked to markets we talked about you know, different strategies he was seeing. And at the time he was, you know, uh, jetting around on his uh, private jet, but buying carbon neutral credits, you know, <laughs> to offset his, his jet setting ways. And it, all of that was brand new at the time, right? And so it was just kind of interesting conversation looking back. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of, I think a lot of politicians end up in you know in the investment management world what either as like an advisor or you know some something uh, and particularly the ones that um work in the treasury department right mm, um right so so i i was around a lot of them in fact but i wasn't um i wasn't pulled into the uh philosophical conversation we were talking shop you know every time right, we got right. together we we're talking shop we weren't talking about like what are your politics what what's my, what are my politics you know we weren't talking about any of that. And it didn't really occur to me that that was a meaningful conversation because quite frankly, I was sort of jaded. I was, you know, I would go into these meetings going, they are gonna say anything, you know, to me. And it may not even be the truth. Right. <laughs> They're just gonna say anything that I wanna hear, you know? So I was pretty jaded uh, against politicians. But one night I attended a dinner uh, that my girlfriend um, uh, 
uh, invited me to. And she strategically sat me at the end of the table, this long table, I'll never forget it. On one end was Debbie Watson and Schultz, who was the chairman of the DNC that year. And on the other end was Congresswoman Karen Bass, who is a well-known Congresswoman even today, you know, uh, in LA. So then halfway through the meal, they would swap, you know, so I got access to both hmm. speakers that night. And it was Congresswoman Bass who looked at me in the eyes and was like, what are you doing to elevate women you know, in your company. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself at the time, I was like, I'm just trying to keep the lights on. I'm trying to keep everybody employed. I'm trying to do good by my employees, right. make sure that we do well so everybody can do well. I wasn't thinking about how to empower yeah. women. You know, again, remember I made this distinction between talking shop and politics. And so when I was talking to her, you know, my head, I was like just running a company. And she was asking me about the politics, right? And I wasn't prepared. I wasn't prepared at all to talk about it. And that night I came home and I go, why not? Why am I not concerned about those things? I should be concerned about those things because when I think about my own trajectory, you know, it was a Jewish man that helped elevate me to where I was. You know, if I had a support system, if I had other women in the investment management world or other Asian Americans, you know, that I could turn to, to sort of mentor me into the process. I didn't have anybody. But you um, could have easily answered, I'm not saying out and open, but you could have easily answered in your head, like, why does it even matter? Who, who cares, right? Like, there's people who go on living, you get a question like that, and you just keep on moving. You're like, doesn't matter. What made you? I guess, I guess I'm not built that way. You know, it just, it just, it just resonated me to the core, you know, where I was like, oh my gosh, I could be doing more. And it was at a time where I had reached some level of success where I felt really super comfortable, right? So her asking me that question made me uncomfortable, right? And made me decide that it wasn't just about succeeding in this field, it was about succeeding in life. And what does that encompass? That encompass, you know, succeeding in your field and being happy with the work that you're doing but also doing good work also, right? In the community, making a good impact. And so that's kind of what kept me up at night after speaking with uh, Karen. And that kind of opened the door a little bit to me. And uh, I think it was that year that it was, it was probably 2012 when President Obama, or maybe it was shortly after that, like 2008, maybe it was his first run at the presidency. And I remember paying more attention to that presidential race than any other one in the past, even though I had been, you know, abreast, kept abreast of the, yeah. of the, uh, of the various elections. I wasn't really like super in it, invested. Yeah. 2008 mm -hmm. was a turning year for me too. I felt the same. Yeah. Way. Just everything turned. You're like, whoa. But you know what? Like I only spent like, I, so I bought a t-shirt when he won because I thought, oh, this is a historic moment. <laughs> you know, I want to have something of history. And so I paid $16. I remember like to buy a t-shirt, right? I still have it. Um, but again, I wasn't pulled in in that way. And it wasn't until honestly, 2016, when Donald Trump got elected because he came from my industry, he came from the real estate industry. I know him, you know, in a personal and professional way. I was like, oh my gosh, how could America get it so wrong? Mm -hmm. wow. <laughs> and that's when I started to realize, you know, listen, we need to get good people in office to keep America on track, right? And, and at that time too, I was um, uh, faced with sort of a decision, you know, a, a liquidity event myself. And I was looking for sort of what's the next chapter in my life. And so it all kind of came, you know, at, mm -hmm. at the same point. And that's when I decided that I wanted to engage more uh, politically. Um, but I was registered as an NPP at the time, no party preference. So it wasn't necessarily that because he was a Republican that made me not like him. It was because I knew Donald Trump and I knew his reputation and I knew sort of the empty suit that he was, right? And, um, and it just frightened me to no end that somebody like that could be the leader, not only of the United States, but of the free world. You know, free world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now. You know, if I have people who are watching right now, they'll probably 
say to themselves like right when you made that comment of because i knew him it, you know you questioned everything they would just hit click turn off this program i'm moving on right and that's sort of like where we are with the political discourse in the in in, in the u.s today like here's somebody you that have had real life experience with somebody like donald trump mm -hmm. and you're actually able to say from your experience what and i haven't even asked you you know what your experience why would you make a comment like that but you are actually in that space where you've actually experienced him and then now we're from this point on in the show we're in a little echo chamber right we're just talking to people who want to hear what we want to hear mm -hmm. right and how do we get beyond that now because yeah you you npp voted npp change your mind because you've had actual experience reward experience with this quote-unquote leader now he's president free work but now people now from this point in watching you and i interact they're like okay i'm done it's, it's time to move on my question always is how do we engage people from this point on the conversation in the conversation forward to kind of i don't know if the word entice is the word but how do we get people to keep dialoguing with us and talking and hearing and listening and kind of you know banging around with the truth of this of the facts and how do we get people engaged in this st sort of stuff anymore yeah I, I think people need to move away from being pro-trump and anti-trump i think that is sort of the defining line uh, in the political discourse today anything related to trump you know, you're either on one end of the spectrum or on the other. Um, I have a lot of friends because I, you know, uh, worked in the investment management industry, lots of conservatives, you know, in that space, uh, but also, you know, uh, lots of progressives too. But I would say the progressives were more moderate, right? Just because um, the dialogue that we have, you know, in terms of the economy right. is really is really the the calibrating factor right yeah. some people may believe human rights should be afforded to everyone you know civil rights should be um uh you know a commonplace right it should be a sort of a god-given right right but the dollar is the metric is what mm -hmm. you're saying yeah. it is it is it's the economy and it's how we talk about the economy so when people talk to me they don't necessarily when i talk about the economy i don't necessarily portray myself as um uh, anti-Trump or pro-Trump, you know, in a lot of ways, I think about the fact that, you know, we left our homeland is, is communist, right? And uh, I don't know if you've ever been back, um, visited there, but I've been back a few times. And, you know, some of the things I really enjoy doing when I'm back in Vietnam is I always interview people. You know, I'm like, what do you do for a living? You know, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Where do you live? And stuff like that. And one of the things they always say to me is like, in order for us to uh, achieve the American dream that you guys have the opportunity to achieve, we actually have to have an American partner because a lot of our assets um, are, you know, sort of um, not ours, you know, we don't have the rights to, right? In the way that um, Americans have rights to their property, to their assets, that kind of thing. And when you listen to that, you realize that we have a very unique structure here in America where it's based on this idea of capitalism that doesn't exist everywhere else, right? right? But we have it here. In a lot of ways, the, the rich and the wealthy and the powerful have tilted the scale, right? So that they make the rules that benefit them, right? And yes, we should recalibrate, we should change the rules. But if we talk about the issues and our values, rather than talk about whether you're pro or anti-Trump, that makes all the difference in the world, right? So I only mentioned him one time, but I'm not gonna mention him anymore yeah. because he embodies a set of values that I don't agree with, right? But uh, I would implore your audience and your listeners to think about what it is that they believe in, not in a figurehead like, like Donald Trump or you know, or Joe Biden, they're just sort of a, a manifestation right. of your set of values. So try to understand what your values are, and then um, sort of go from there. Yeah, that's a great answer. Yeah, it's easier, Thank you. 
it's easier said than done too, right? For, it is, it for is sure. because the because people are so superficial with their politics. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, right? <clears throat> it's like, why do you hate Trump? I mean, why do you do you why do you like Trump? Why do you hate Trump? You have to be able to answer that because you can't just say, oh, he's a disgusting person mm -hmm. or I love him because he's very strong against China, which right. I hear a lot in our community, right? In our community, we're like, because he's hard on China and we yeah. love that because China's our oppressor. Okay, outside of that, because <laughs> Joe Biden also has very tough conversations with China as well, right? So outside of that, what else do you like and what else don't you like? And that's when the conversation falls apart because there's not a lot of substance there, right? And so I would ask our community specifically where we are going through this generational conversation about values and issues, I would ask them to think about that. So take away your top reason. What is the number two, number three, number four reason, right? On why you believe a certain way or why you vote a certain way. And that's when you sort of get to the meat of, okay, is there some value here that I can articulate right. that I can make more clear? Or you know, is there some kind of exchange that I can have with you? So 2016 happens and then rolls into 2018. And then by 2019, there's press on um, what you've started, uh, Asian American Horizon, right? It's 2019, I started seeing articles mm -hmm. and press stuff on, on around that time. So what, what happens between the time that Trump gets um, into office and then what's your journey <clears throat> to doing the work that you do today? Yeah, so initially when I, um, when 2016 happened and I thought, okay, I wanna engage politically. Um, I initially found a home with other women, you know, because um, you go to what you know, right? I was um, hanging around certain friends who, was, who were feeling the same way. And so I connected with them in that way. And so it became kind of like fun, right? To do that as a, yeah. as a side and sort of like, instead of having this other hobby, we were you know, politically engaged. But somewhere in the middle between after the midterms in 2018, uh, you know, I, someone tapped me on the shoulder and said, what about the Asian American community? And I said to myself, well, what about the Asian American community, <laughs> right? Like, can't we just be all encompassing? Like if I'm working with women, I can work with Asian American women, you know? But there were very, very specific issues in our community. And then now, particularly in the Vietnamese American community, right? That needs uh, development, that needs people like us, you know, opening doors to different hard conversations. And it can't be done by like the DNC or the RNC or white people necessarily. It has to be from within the community. Right. And so that's when I realized, I said, well, there is a space where there's a void and there's a big need in our community. And maybe, you know, I can contribute positively in that space. And lo and behold, it was in Orange County um, um, that uh, there wasn't a, another group that was doing just that, right? And so I felt that um, we could be the catalyst for those conversations but I wanted to do it in a very specific way. I wanted to do it in a nonpartisan way. I wanted to do it in a way that was very civil, that I wanted to bring people in to the dialogue without intimidating them. Yeah. I also didn't want political activation to mean protests. Cause you know, like we come from a country where you protest, you might end up in jail, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? And so our first instinct isn't necessarily to go and protest cause we don't feel pretty secure about that, right? right? So I wanted to disentangle the idea of political activism with you know, marches and protests. I wanted to just bring people into the fold and whether they are super mature in their philosophy, the political philosophy, or they're just beginning. I wanted to have a home that was a safe harbor for all of those people, right? And so that's what Asian Americans Rising is about. It's about you know, providing that platform for people to engage so that we can meet them where they are. They will read things passively. I have a lot of passive members who will just read stuff, never comment.
but then they'll say something to me like, you know, six months down the road, oh, I, I remember this particular thing that was said. And I know that they're engaging, but they're just not actively yeah. engaging. But I know that we're reaching people, right? And it's offering that safe harbor. It's really the most important thing right now as we're trying to find our voice, right? And as we're trying to figure out who we are independent of our parents, right? Because a lot of our young people are, are seeing themselves on an opposite playing field, you know, as the, the playing field that their parents arrived, you know, when, when we got here initially. And so things have changed a lot. Well, how do you, um, because I was like trying to wrap my mind around the description of nonpartisan, right? In yeah. Asian American Rising. I get it mm -hmm. from a sort of like a 30,000 foot view, like, okay, <clears throat> Asian American Rising, not Democrat or Republican Asian American Rising. It's general, it's an umbrella Asian American Rising. But then how do you, can? how can you get away with saying nonpartisan? <clears throat> because we're going to have to pick a team to play on, right? Or... How does this work? Yeah. Well, we try not to um, we try not to champion candidates because in my mind, candidates are not the answer. The people are the answer. We mm -hmm. are the ones empowering those candidates, right, to do and be accountable to us. So it was a voter engagement exercise as opposed to a candidate endorsing platform. So when you put all your eggs in one candidate and be it that they are Republican or Democrat, you tend to find yourself having to like follow through, right? And agree with everything they say and everything they do and you have mm -hmm. to kind of defend them. And yeah. that's how tribalism happens. And that's where people dig in and say, no, 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 my guy is the good guy. Your guy is the bad guy, right? But if we're just empowering voters to explore kind of what their values are and we remove that part of politics where you have to be pro-candidate or anti-candidate, you can then like certain things about this candidate and then like other things about this other candidate, right? And then you're able to sort of form your ideology on your own terms. So that in that way, we are nonpartisan because other than the presidential uh, election, this 2020, um, there, wasn't, there wasn't a ton of, you know, we didn't endorse People, we didn't, there wasn't a ton of, um, you know, um, candidate events that we were publicizing, you know, certain people did do that on their own because it was their candidate. But um, as an organization, it wasn't something that we promoted or we, you know, necessarily focused on. It was about why do you like this candidate? Or why don't you like this candidate, right? And let's figure out um, as a voter, you know, what, what you care about and what don't you care about. So the Asian American Rising brand is truly nonpartisan, it sounds like, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Yeah. Sort of I mean, we're progressive. So I have to say that we do say that we're progressive. Um, but what you'll find is that there's a lot of room in that definition of progressive, right? Um, and there's a lot of different uh, ownership of what that means, right? Because certain people will latch on to things that we say that are uh, in their mind, progressive, and then you know, um, other people, you know, on the left will think that we're not being so progressive, right? So there's a lot of room there, but I do want, I don't want to mislead people, and I don't want people to feel like when they enter our space that uh, if they don't, um, you know, if they don't subscribe generally to progressive values, it's probably not a good space for them. Right, because they may feel um, attacked, or may, they may feel, um, you know, like, you know, they they can't um, they can't uh, be open about their opinions, and that might sound like contradictory to what yeah, I just I said just earlier about the exploration. Yeah. yeah, but but there's a sense of I'm carving out space for those people that are leaning one way to sort of discover exactly why they're progressive or what, how far out in the spectrum they are, right? Um, we could do something where it's completely nonpartisan and we invite in both sides. But what ends up happening, like you just said, is that people talk at each other yeah. at that point. You're not developing ideas at that point, right? 
you're just sort of like um, pitting one group against another and having people dig in. I can imagine even in the space of progressive that mm-hmm. there is extremes that are happening on, you know, right? Oh, yeah. Just oh, yeah. that space. But do yeah. you get people from the other side coming in and sort of saying, all right, I want to sit down and have dialogue? Or is it mostly the spectrums of within the progressive space? Yeah, I mean, you know, certainly we we don't have conversations with people who are, you know, racist, right, who uh, come on the space and uh, fundamentally disagree with Asian Americans having a space, right? So we, we obviously don't invite uh, those people in. So to a certain extent, we are already sort of um, defining the, the minimum right. requirements. Yeah, yeah. Um, but outside of that, I think there's a lot of room for people to voice their opinions and their uh, philosophy. And we try not to, um, you know, manage that. We try to leave, an, you know, a lot of space for people to, uh, to express themselves. Um, you know, what, uh, what our philosophy has always been is that, um, you know, if you have an open mind, if you're curious about where you are in the political spectrum, you're going to fi- define yourself first as a progressive or a conservative, right? And then that will then direct you to the door that you want to enter. Right. And we, we want to be very explicit about that because we don't want to mislead people. We don't want pe- to turn people away from political engagement. So at a bare minimum, we tell them that we're the progressive door. But after that, there's you know no other parameters that we put on. Right, that's fair. It's fair game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So we're nonpartisan here, but we are open to the more progressive sort of like the that dialogue, that direction. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And then we can just take it from there and debate and have dialogue. Yeah. But, you know, we make the distinction that we're not a democratic organization, right? right? Because when you put yourself out there and you hang the shingle that you're a democratic organization, then actually in your bylaws, you're supposed to stand for everything the party stands for. You're not supposed to deviate. So in a way, that's how tribe tribes are formed, yeah. right? Yeah, and so by by saying that we're progressive and not democratic, we're making that very subtle distinction, right? Sure. That we are not always going to be aligned 100% with one party. So you've been around for what, two years now? Mm-hmm. Two, three years or two, you know, what is your day-to-day at, this organization like you lead it you started it uh right and what's mm-hmm. your day-to-day what, do you, what is your directive what's your agenda for the like every day what are you going in you know what's what's your job like description like oh you know it's it's one thing that i do among a lot of things that uh that i do um i started a company called g3 ventures which is basically three different silos we have the impact investment silo which i still do because i mm-hmm. come from that space right um, we have uh, community advocacy, um, which is part of Asian Americans Rising, where that portfolio belongs. And then we have um, what I call innovative philanthropy. So uh, impact investing is investments. Innovative philanthropy is sort of grant making, right? Um, supporting nonprofits. Um, and then community advocacy is that piece where we can do political engagement. And so that's how I spend my day, sort of a third, a third, a third. And then of mm-hmm. course, you know, I'm a parent and I, you know, all this other stuff too. Um, but yeah, so Asian Americans Rising is part of a constellation uh, that I feel that I'm part of. Um, I'm also a board member of the API Victory Fund and that's a national pack as well. And so um, what, I, what I do locally ties a lot into what the Victory Fund does nationally. And, um, you know, I find that I have flexibility to be able to sort of run my own space, right. but also be able to be connected to this larger organization or this larger community of Asian Americans, you know. So my day to day is, um, you know, taking meetings, uh, a lot of like uh, interviewing candidates because they want our support. Um, and um, but really just about how do we uh relay information to the community in a way that is uh, balanced and in a way that's inviting, right? And so we try to curate events where we actually actively engage 
the community, right? So it's not just about talking all the time because people can only talk so much and they can only read so many articles. You have to, like the next step of engagement is actually doing something. So we try to curate high level events where they feel like they're a valued part of the political discourse, where they're not just showing up at some random meeting without an agenda, without, you know, sort of organization that it's, 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 it's an event that if they take the time to, to participate in, that it will make a, a lasting impact somehow. Okay. Can you right? give me an example of an event? Yeah. An action? Yeah. We just hosted, we just co-sponsored the uh, Asian Pacific American Heritage Month Unity Summit with the Victory Fund and Victory Alliance. That took place yesterday, actually. And so uh, the Unity Summit was basically Kamala Harris came on and she uh, did her keynote. Um, and then we invited uh, senators of color. Um, so it was Cory Booker, it was um, Maisie Hirono and others to talk about what it's like to work together across different racial groups, right? And being able to build this right. coalition. And um, we were able to, as a sponsor, we were able to give some free tickets uh, to attendees. And then there was an after party after the summit, which featured Hillary Clinton and Lisa Ling and Simu Liu and uh, Richard Verma, who is a former ambassador to India. And so we were able to give some tickets to our members to attend that. And so that is pretty curated stuff. Yeah. You know, that's not your, you know, run of the mill event. That's something that they can get access, that they can get exposure to that is different from their day to day. And this was not just virtual or was it in person? It was virtual. Yeah, it was virtual, unfortunately. In years past, the summit was um, in person in D.C. Um, but this year, because it was virtual, we were able to offer this, you know, to members, longstanding members, but also uh, to people who were like, just curious, who are on our page. And, you know, just, just because of the anti-Asian hate that's going around, newly activated, you know, Asian Americans in our community. And we just kind of offered it on a first come first serve basis so that everybody has an equal shot at being able to participate. How do you get funding for your organization? Excuse me. Um, uh, I mainly fund it, um, and then we also, uh, from time to time, get you know donations from other people to support it. Um, you know, I'm I'm in a position where uh, I can you know self sustain the organization, um, and by doing so, I feel like you know I have this duty to always be an asset to the community, right, and to yeah. be um, uh, a resource. Uh, to the community in a way that maybe other grassroots organizations may not be able to um, to achieve. So in that way, I, I don't like asking for money from people. <laughs> I feel like as long as I can sustain it, um, you know, I will always offer it as a community resource. Well, oh, that's a big um, that's big shoes to fill, right? I mean, I very admirable. It's like putting your really putting <laughs> your money where your mouth is. Yeah, it is because, um, you know, I take responsibility for um, the things that go on and the, the events and the organizations that we promote uh, on that page. Uh, and oftentimes we will connect with other organizations doing very similar work. And, you know, what I have learned in my life is that I don't have the, I don't have to be the end all be all. I can be a conduit, you know, and there are other people that exist that can do a really, really good job. And they have done a really, really good job for a long time. And what we should do is use our resources so that we connect people to sort of where it's the best fit, uh, as opposed to trying to cannibalize the effort, right? right? Take away from yeah. what they're currently doing. So I, I don't believe in that at all. And so in a lot of ways, I feel like I'm a navigator. You know, you come to me, you're like, I'm interested in this. And then I help you sort of catapult you in the right direction. What? are the the near-term goals like a one-year thing and a 10-year you know if you could put it on a graphic you like okay if i could accomplish this in the next 12 months i've accomplished what i've set out to do and then maybe a five and ten year like what what kind of vision yeah. you can tell well you know one thing that we're working on right now is um collectively be 
you know, part of this uh, Asian American constellation where we're working together as a community to achieve common goals. Um, and one thing that we just kicked off yesterday was this, a this idea of an AAPI think tank. So, you know, we all have felt the angst of this year, right? Our, seeing our elders um, being harassed and being threatened and brutalized sometimes. And it's really touched us, you know, struck, struck a chord in all of us. And I've seen activism in our community that I've never seen before, right. you know, in the sh even in the short time that I've been doing this, right? Like it was really hard to get Asians engaged. And then all of a sudden, you know, you see a lot of people sort of coming out um, uh, you know, and being engaged. And what I'd like to see is this energy being mobilized in a way that creates lasting impact. And the only way to do that really, when it comes to politics is through policies, right? And so this think tank hopefully will be the genesis of where you take this energy, this new bound energy and put together people with lived experience in our diaspora, connect them with, um, uh, you know, really, really smart people who do policy making for a living, right? right? And then create a set of recommendations that we can then push on to, you know, all the different levels of government. And then once they enact it, then you have a system, a structure for change to occur, right? So I, I would like to see that, um, you know, take off in the next couple of years. That's where I would be focusing a lot of my time and energy. Um, but in a five year, 10 year, um, uh, framework, I would love to see a National Asian American Museum. Um, you know, we're talking about adding curriculum uh, to K through 12 um, schools to, to include our history, our community history into ethnic studies. Um, but, you know, very similar to the, to, you know, the Jewish community, for example, you almost have to have something tangible, right, to, 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 to take people to uh, so that they can have that lived experience. It's one thing to kind of hear yes. about it. It's another thing to actually go and physically visit something and, you know, be immersed in it. So I'd love to see a National Asian American Museum uh, take root, you know, somewhere in DC, probably on the National Mall somewhere. Um, and collectively as, an, as a community, I would like to see us, you know, support that. Um, but for the Vietnamese community in particular, um, we, we have not done, you know, we have been here for 40 years, right? Since the first arrival of uh, the post-war refugees. 45 and years, but who's counting? <laughs> there you go. That, I, see, um, but I'm um, 45 and, you know, I was like born here the first wave. So yeah, it's, yeah. Can you believe it? You used to be oh, 30. No. I was like 35 I know. And 40, now it's 45. Dang it, yeah. We'll 50 here but, soon, yeah. Well, when we reach that mark, you know, you have to yeah. think about it. I'm like, what, what, what are we trying to accomplish as a community, right? Like, what can we do to set the next generation up for success, right? So our family struggled, they survived, you know, and it's our turn now to ensure that the next generation truly thrive, right, in this, in this um, uh, new homeland of ours. So um, I started something called Viet CDF, which is the Vietnamese American Community Development Fund. And what it is, is it's a community development corporation that will make investments in the Vietnamese community, whether it's housing or um, employment opportunities or trainings or education, things like that, to really supplement the infrastructure of Little Saigon and places like that. You know, I mean, there's some, um, we have some social services, but we don't have, for example, like a, an organization specifically for domestic violence, right? We don't, have an, or we don't have a senior center, for example, that has supportive services. Our, our seniors are either living with us, <laughs> you yeah. know, or they're off on their own and they're not connected to services that they need in order to thrive as seniors, right? And whereas, you know, the white community, the mainstream community, they have those places. We don't have that. So we sorely lack a lot of infrastructure and I think it's about time that we start thinking about how to build that infrastructure for our community and really getting hopefully some of this infrastructure money to help support that. Katie, you know how I know you're the real deal? What? You answer these concrete, you answer with concrete answers. 
So like mm-hmm. I asked you about, you know, your vision, your short-term, long-term vision, and even going as far as the C- CDF, I think you said, the, mm-hmm. all of these are concrete plans that are actionable and they're practical applications of theory, right? That you have thought about and said, this is going to better um, Asian Americans. Um, and you put it into, um, you put it into sort of this, the thought goes into words and the words become these actions and you're bringing people together it's amazing and um you're offering a pipeline of sort of this pipeline of thoughts of how to improve the asian american experience in america and i you know i stand definitely behind that and thank you yeah i mean it's not a partisan issue right Mm -mm. it's not a partisan issue it's not. It's it, it's about how, you know, we all at a very human level want to see each other succeed, do better. Yeah. Do better. You know, that, that's like our innate goal for our kids, right? Is I want you to live a better life. I want you to have it all, right? Um, and for us, sometimes when we get to that level of success, we just get, we're so tired, <laughs> you know, and we just want to like, again, don't, you know, we stop doing the hard work um, and we forget about, you know, being able to uh, um, set out that ladder for the yeah. next generation. Yeah. And I, I want people to realize that um, if we don't, you know, there's no one else that will. And it, it, is, it is a call to action to our community to all chip in. We, we, we owe it to each other. We owe it to ourselves. Nobody's gonna care for, our people the way we care for our people. And so, you know, I, I ask all the people who have achieved any kind of modicum of success to think about that. Yeah. And if your talent is not to roll up your sleeves and get this work done, be an architect for change, you know, be a donor. Whatever it is, don't disengage because um, it's very easy for us to slip backwards, you know, if we're not looking forward. And yeah. so- And one- of the best things that have come out from this anti-Asian, you know, all of this uh, violence and all of this abuse um, in our community is mm-hmm. getting together and having a reason to mobilize and move forward, right? Yeah. I mean, if there is a silver lining, it's tragic that it takes yeah. this kind of event for us to come together and to be awakened, right? And to be aware. But um let's call it what it is. It's a collective moment of trauma yeah. for our community, right? Some of us remember Vincent Chin, you know, and that wave of activism in 1982. Uh, lots of people don't have that in their consciousness, right? So this is their first experience of this kind of community trauma. And I think it's great that we're channeling the pain into action, right? But at the same time, I would ask that everybody take a pause and say, okay, how do I best channel this energy, right? What are my specific talents and what can I contribute to the cause that's unique, you know? And just sort of don't go with what is easy necessarily. Go do some homework, do some due diligence, seek out the change that you wanna create and, and just invest in it. And now, you know, we're so, in, we're so connected, you know, virtually now that it doesn't mean that we can't be connected to a cause in New York City or, or you know, wherever else, right? And, we can yeah. be. And, and across sort of community lines, you know, our mm-hmm. alliance with our um, Korean American uh, community. So, you know, I want to, I hear, I'm here at this moment, think I want to shout out to Kate Park, who is a Korean American um, yeah. connector who's uh, introduced me to so many uh, people in my own community, in my own Vietnamese mm-hmm. community. Kate Park, you know, she's Korean and she um, unifies the Asian American um, people in LA and and throughout the United States. But ironically, she's, you know, brought us Vietnamese more together. Um, So the the fact that we're um, modeling sort of our work uh, to to get all of the Asian communities together, I think is a wonderful thing um, at this that's happening in this time and, and space. Yeah, yeah, I, I really do hope this new um, definition, this 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 phrase of Asian Americans take root, right? Because we're only 
powerful when we're together, that when we stand united, right? Because if you slice up the 7% of Asian Americans in the United States, even further down to like Vietnamese and Koreans and stuff like that, I mean, it's inconsequential to the country. Yeah. And we can only harness our power if we come together. So, so yeah, no, I mean, Kate's been great. She's always been super supportive. Um, uh, she once told me in the very beginning days of my activism, she was like, you know, who rules um, the Asian American community? I was like, who? And she was like, um, aunties and divas. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, well, what if you're neither one? <laughs> And she was like chuckling, you know, and, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, I mean, there's probably some truth to that, right? The, the aunties that have been doing this for a long yeah. time, let's pay homage to them. The divas, of course, the ones that, you know, are in the limelight, you know, I guess you can call them divas, but they're the ones that are in the, uh, uh, doing the work, right? And so let's pay homage to that as well. But let's not forget that there's a whole crop of new people that are you know, wanting to come into the space and we have to create that space for them. You know, We do a terrible job sometimes of, um, of, of creating runway for that. Right. And yeah. we're so dismissive sometimes, we're so critical. You know, like if you're not like me, then you, 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 know, you suck. <laughs> I mean, and, that's you know, historically part of you know, our legacy almost you know, um, from the previous generation. So I think we're scrubbing that and to sort of work through that and it takes time and people like you um kate you know are all um i I admire so much of the work that that you know you you both are doing and i want to thank you today um for spending this amount of time with me and is there anything else that you want to um to say before we say goodbye well, no, I just want to congratulate you and the work that you're doing. It, you play a very critical role in telling these stories. You know, please continue to do that. And I know that it's, you know, sometimes a labor of love, right? As yes. all these things are, and you're paving the way for, again, additional, um, you know, uh, future paths forward. So I thank you. I, I understand that there's a privilege uh, for you and I to, to be sitting here uh, to be speaking about this stuff today. So thank you. And I appreciate that. And um, I continue um, to, you know, explore the dialogue and I want to um, hopefully have you back on in a short amount of time from now when there's things that are starting to come up and things that we need to discuss. But thank you so much, Katie. I, I really appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Vietnamese with Kenneth Nguyen. The Vietnamese is produced by Brittany Tran and Javier Poenza. Special thanks to Jane Nguyen, Catherine Nguyen, Tina Pham, Sydney Jamie, and Christo Trin. Please find us on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at The Vietnamese Podcast. You can also find us on YouTube where you can subscribe, like, and comment. Please rate and give us a review wherever you find our podcast. Thanks again for listening.